Sigma Tiger News all up in your grill with the hottest, juiciest beef online. What do we got today? Nuclear Armageddon, protest amnesty, plastic polluters, who are they? I think we all know, maybe a surprise, and bottlenose bird flu. <laughs> And you're here with the big sig tig. Let's dive right in. What do we got? Kaboom! 72 minutes until the end of the world. A new book lays out the frighteningly fast path to nuclear Armageddon. It's an image of a nuclear explosion somewhere out in the ocean. You can see a bunch of frigates, some battleships. All right, let's see what we have. Nuclear war would be bad. I think we can all agree on that. Everyone knows this. Most people would probably rather not think through the specifics. But Annie Jacobson, an author of seven books on sensitive national security topics, wants you to know exactly how bad it would be. Her new book, Nuclear War, A Scenario, sketches out a global nuclear war with by-the-minute precision for all of the 72 minutes between the first missile launch and the end of the world. It's already a bestseller. It goes without saying that the scenario is fictional, but it is a journalistic work in that the scenario is constructed from dozens of interviews and documentation, some of it newly declassified as a factual grounding to describe what could happen. Uh, that's this in Jacob's, Jacobson's telling. A North Korean leader launches an intercontinental ballistic missile at the Pentagon. And then a submarine launched ballistic missile at a nuclear reactor in California. For reasons beyond the scope of the book, except to illustrate what one mad king with nuclear weapons could do, a harried president has a mere six minutes to decide on a response. While also being evacuated from the White House and pressured by the military to launch America's own ICBMs at all 82 North Korean targets relevant to the nation's nuclear and military forces and leadership, these missiles must fly over Russia whose leaders spot them, assume their country is under attack, their respective presidents can't get one another on the phone, and send a salvo back in the other direction, and so on, until 72 minutes later, three nuclear-armed states have managed to kill billions of people, with the remainder left starving on a poisoned earth, where the sun no longer shines and food no longer grows. Yikes, sounds absolutely terrifying, so we need to uh, immediately harness the ability to grow inside buildings. I mean, they're doing it. You just get the UV lights, the seeds, some hydroponics, and bingo bango. But what do you do about the scorched earth and contaminated everything else? Some scholars, particularly among those who favor large nuclear arsenals as the best deterrent to being attacked with such weapons ourselves, have criticized some of Jacobson's assumptions. The U.S. wouldn't have to court Russian miscalculation by overflying Russia with ICBMs when it has submarine-launched ballistic missiles in the Pacific. Public sources indicate that the president's six-minute response window is still about in line with what Ronald Reagan noted with dismay in his memoirs, but that assures he's boxed into a launch-on-warning policy, something Jacobson's source characterized as constraint to move before enemy missiles actually strike, but which government policy documents insist is merely an option and not a mandate. The president could also just decide contra the deterrence touchstone of mutual assured destruction not to nuke anybody at all in response. <clears throat> And, uh, yeah, explain that one to the people. So there you have it, people. Uh, if Russia or uh, Iran's got nuclear capabilities now, I believe, of course, North Korea has mentioned, uh, China, India, I believe, also has nuclear capabilities. There's any number of reasons why something like this could pop off. I mean, there was a drone that flew into a base and they thought it was one of their own and it exploded. You know, so uh, there's lots of different reasons why this could happen. It's unlikely to happen. It's like, you know, bringing a knife to a gunfight. The person with the gun's probably not as afraid. You know, two people have guns. Someone shoots. People are going to get killed. And that's like as easy as it is to realize that if you set off one of these things, it's going to be a chain reaction. And that's why 72 minutes. One shoots. Another reacts. People freak out. You've seen how people freaked out just a few years ago. 
All right, let's continue. What do we have? California facing a bear invasion. Hibernation's over. It was in the Los Padres National Forest. Mountain Club, California has always been surrounded by wildlife. This one just doesn't even care that I'm here. But now it's turned into what some here are calling an invasion. Black bears now out of the woods and crawling onto patios, somehow opening car doors. Holy even breaking into homes. This one chased away by a non-lethal gun. How would you describe the bear? Yeah, so heads up, anyone in California, because this happens every single year. It's nothing new. But uh, spring is here, so watch out. Russian troops have evacuated the first U.S. man-made M1 Abrams tanks from the front line near Advedevka. Chief press officer of Russia's battle group, Center Alexander Savchuk told Sputnik. According to him, soon everyone will be able to see the trophy at an exhibition of NATO equipment captured in the Special Military Operations Zone in uh, Polkanya Hill, Moscow. Yeah, so basically, a um, bunch of tanks were delivered to the front lines. Bunch of tanks delivered to the front lines in Ukraine and uh, easily destroyed and dismantled. There's a whole bunch of... Uh, Hoopla about actually sending them over there and how it could escalate the war, and uh, it looks like they did nothing. So says Russia. And, uh, yeah, all the migrants coming across might have something else to worry about. Not crossing the actual border, but uh, crossing the water. Go ahead and have a look at this. Uh, Eagle Pass local resident Luis Del Torre came across an alligator while fishing this morning at the Rio Grande. Or Grande, sorry. Previous sightings of alligators have been confirmed by Border Patrol. Not something you want to run into while trying to cross the river. Just waiting. So heads up to any of the uh, migrants there. You'll probably get a little text message on your UN supplied phone. Uh, alerting you to possible uh, crocodiles, or gators, whatever that was. Anyway, student protesters seek amnesty to keep arrests, suspensions from trailing them. So what is amnesty? That's like forgiveness, right? Like, you know, okay, we see what you've done. Uh, we're going to accept you for what you've done. And what have they done? Let's have a look. Miriam Alwyn figured the worst was over after New York City police in riot gear arrested her and other protesters at the Columbia University campus, loaded them onto buses, and held them in custody for hours. Uh, but the next evening, the college junior received an email from the university. Alwyn and other students were being suspended after their arrests at the Gaza Solidarity Encampment, a tactic colleges across the country have deployed to calm growing campus protests against the Israel-Hamas war. The students' plight has become a central part of protests, with students and growing number of faculty demanding their amnesty. At issue is whether universities and law enforcement will clear the charges and withhold other consequences, or whether the suspensions and legal records will follow students into their adult laws. So, like, I don't understand this, like, how, like, there's laws in place, and literally, like, you know, they're easily accessible. Just type it in, what are my state laws and federal laws? And you'll find it. You can even find municipal laws. Boom. Bylaws. Anything. Like, am I allowed to plant a tree? Municipal bylaw. Yep. I am. But it's only allowed to be like this. And it has to be a certain distance from the street. And power lines. So, protesting. Totally legal. You're allowed to voice your opinion. Occupation. It's like the FACE Act or whatever it is. These people, Christians, went in and blocked the entrance to an abortion clinic. So because they did that, they're going to serve felony offenses of like 10 to 15 years or something like that. I mean, it's a law. They could have been aware of it and they're moving forward with it. So why should these people be treated any differently when they set up encampments and occupied uh, a public place, you know? Students aren't being allowed to enter into certain parts of the campus. Just check Twitter. There's all kinds of people being like, hey, I'd like to get in. I'm, I work here, or I have class, or I want to go wherever and study. And they just stand there and they're like, no, you're a genocider or a sympathizer of uh, Zionist genociders, whatever they're getting on with. But anyway, it should follow them, 100%. Terms of suspension vary from campus to campus. At Columbia 
and its affiliated Barnard College for Women, all one and dozens more were arrested April 18th and promptly barred from campus and classes, unable to attend in person or virtually, and banned from dining halls. Absolutely, because they were definitely given a warning that, you know, disperse or else, this is the consequence. <clears throat> Questions about their academic futures remain. Will they be allowed to take final exams? Maybe, maybe not. What about financial aid? Graduation, Columbia says outcomes will be decided at disciplinary hearings, but Owen says she has not been given a date. Ooh, it feels very dystopian, she said. Well, no, not at all. It feels very contemporary, to be honest. Like, you know, you break the law and you have to go through the system, and the system takes a lot of time. I don't know what to say. Like, you know what I mean? If you're stupid and you're going to do something and you're warned not to do it, and then you continue doing it, and you don't verify what the consequences are of your actions, then you're dumb. That's all there is to it. Yeah, so here's the other kicker. Uh, White House silent if anti-Israel protesters will be barred from student loan forgiveness programs, because this is exactly um, what's happening. Here we have a red alert, breaking news. Anti-Israel mob occupies Columbia Building, still ongoing, as Trump faces trial. I think they just fined him like $9,000 for... Uh, violating his uh, texting terms, talking about the case. They gagged him up. <clears throat> White House silent. Yeah, so uh, should they get their uh, federal loans forgiven now that they're criminals? You know, so it's again, like these people, they affluent, you know, going to university is no joke. Some people get scholarships and go, but some people have to get student loans, you know what I mean? And if your parents make a certain amount of money or you have uh, affluence, you don't often qualify for these loans. So, you know, you go ahead and break the law. Like banks are debanking people just for having conservative opinions or, uh, you know what I mean, going against the narrative. So what's the deal here? Are these kids going to get in trouble? I hope so. I certainly hope so. Or what? what's going to stop them? If there's no consequences then are these kids going to grow up and become white-collar criminals? Because they're like, oh, yeah, you know, well, in university, we did all kinds of stuff. I got arrested. Yeah, you know what I mean? What a great story. And nothing happened. Not a thing. They even forgave my loans. Can you believe it? Yeah, believe it. China set to launch high-stakes mission to the moon's hidden side. What the heck? Something hiding the moon's secrets. China will send a robotic spacecraft in the coming days on a round trip to the moon's far side in the first of three technically demanding missions that will pave the way for an inaugural Chinese crew landing and a base on the lunar south pole eventually. Since the Chang's mission in 2007 named after the mythical Chinese moon goddess, China has made leaps forward in the lunar explanation, narrowing the technological chasm with the United States and Russia. In 2020, China brought back samples from the moon's near side to the first sample retrieval in more than four decades, confirming for the first time it could safely return an uncrewed spacecraft to Earth from the lunar surface. So weird that like 80 years ago, they just did it like a couple of times, bunch of times, not really big errors and stuff, like with calculating power of a of a, a computer, but it was like a giant room full. And uh, you know what I mean? Like everyone's like, they sent a robot up and back. Like, wow, pretty great. Well, is it because it's unmanned and it's remote controlled? More than likely. This week's China is expected to launch the Chang'e 6 using the backup spacecraft from the 2020 mission and collect soil and rocks from the side of the moon that permanently faces away from Earth. Weird, right? The Earth is spinning around the sun. It's also rotating. And then we've got a moon that's spinning around us and also rotating. And how far the sun is from the Earth and the moon just perfectly fits over that circle. So strange, right? And the moon spins as well, but the way that it spins and how we spin, we only get to see one side. Absolutely crazy. So we'll keep you posted on what's going on with China and their little uh, moon rock mission. Governor Greg Abbott orders Texas to ignore Biden administration's new federal protections of LGBTQ plus students. Interesting, because uh, they're talking about Title IX, which was protections for women. You know what I mean? They had a safe space. And by protecting the few, like 1%, maybe... Uh, that's for trans. But globally, I would say like the entire population of these LGBTQ plus is probably two to five percent max. And that's negligible. <clears throat> so they're saying to protect the few, we're going to hurt half. Because if you think of men and women, it's pretty much 50 50, maybe like 50 to 148, margin of error, or whatever, 1%. 
But anyway, so they're going to hurt 50% of women by saying that men or anyone LGBTQ plus can join, go in the bathrooms, do every what you want to make you feel comfortable and safe as one of these people, an alt. Uh, and destroy women's safety and privacy. It's absolutely absurd. And then I came up with something there on yesterday's show. Check it out. Pansexual. They're the ones who, who are like, you know what I mean, fluid or maybe non-binary. Any one of these, whatever, can they be on both teams? Because I'm telling you, if I was the coach, you know what I mean, the coaches are like, this is great. You know what I mean? Our girls team is going to be rocking. Hey, Eric, you know what I mean? Like, I love that long hair. Have you ever thought about playing for the girls team? You know, uh, Erica, maybe, you know, there might be some of that stuff going on. I'm sure there is. But if you were able to play both sides, imagine you got a scholarship to college and you got a double scholarship. You got to play on both sides and then the incentives now from the NCAA. Absolutely insane. So good job, Greg Abbott. Uh, DeSantis is doing the same thing over there in Florida, not pay playing ball with the insanity of the left. And uh, update on George Allen Kelly, the rancher who uh, shot a migrant uh, by accident with a long gun. Uh, apparently he heard some noise outside of his house while eating breakfast, some gunshots, so he went out there and he fired a warning shot with his rifle. And then when he went to um, patrol the area, they found a dead migrant. And uh, no retrial, mistrial, or whatever it was, a hung jury. So good for him. Great. Should never have been a trial in the first place. And let's talk about it. Plastic's a big deal. Canada freaks out about how much plastic there is, and it turns out paper straws are even worse. Coated with Teflon, it comes off and gets all in your body. All up in everything, pl microplastics in the frozen Arctic, in storms that fall, hurricanes, typhoons, all that stuff, floating around the ocean, Great Pacific, garbage patch, just, it's even worse. And then uh, it's in placenta, it's in our bloodstream, it's everywhere, you can't get away from it. So who's to blame for the global plastic waste and epidemic? Let's find out. More plastic companies make, the more pollution it creates. Really, unbelievable. Who would have guessed? The seemingly obvious yet previously unproven point is the main takeaway from the first of its kind study published Wednesday in the journal Science Advances. Researchers from a dozen universities around the world found that for every 1% increase in the amount of plastic a company uses, there's an associated 1% increase in the contribution to global plastic litter. So if this is accurate, then like Bravo Canada and Stephen Gilbo for like, you know, trying to shut it down. I'm a huge proponent of plastic being like the worst, like it's not good. Like they abandon glass. They don't even recycle that because it's too heavy. In other words, if Coca-Cola is producing one-tenth of the world's plastic, the researchers predicts that the beverage behemoth is responsible for about one-tenth of the identified plastic litter on beaches or in parks, rivers, and other ecosystems. I mean, you know, there it is. That's relational. That finding shook me up a lot. I was really distraught, said Wynne Cowger, a researcher at the Moore Institute for Plastic Pollution Research and the study's lead author. It suggests that companies loudly proclaimed efforts to reduce their plastic footprint aren't doing much at all and that more is needed to make them scale down the amount of plastic they produce. Absolutely, just how about eliminate it? Say, uh, if you're going to put something in a beverage, you know, like, what is the citric acid in a soda doing? Is it, you know, the soda's there, sitting there on the thing for a year? Like, what's the shelf life of that stuff? It's definitely degrading. Like, if you look at the bottom of your plastic bottle, there's a little looks like a recycling symbol, the three arrows in a triangle, and it'll have a number inside. And you can go online and be like, what the heck is this? And it'll say, oh, yeah, don't reuse this bottle. It degrades. Don't leave it in the sun. Wash it with soap, but don't wash it with this because it'll degrade. So plastic's bad. We all know that. So who is doing the polluting? Obviously, Coca-Cola is one. Half the litter the volunteers collected couldn't be tied to a specific company either because they'd never had a logo or because its branding had faded or worn off. Among the rest, still a handful of companies, mostly in the food and beverage sector, turned up most often. Top 10 polluters were Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Danone, Altria, the parent company of Philip Morris USA, Philip Morris International, which is a separate company that sells many of the same products. I believe Philip Morris is tobacco. Uh, more than one in 10 of the pieces came from Coca-Cola, a top polluter. There you go. So there you have it. It's just everywhere. It's all up in the gaff. If you can avoid it, try to. That's all I can say. Uh, but, you know. All kinds of cancers going on in the gut and collectoral area, intestinal, you know, ovary, that area for young people right now. It's just like blowing up. Apparently there's a cancer epidemic calling it turbo cancer and stuff. Is it because of all the plastic? Has the quality gone down? 
just over the years over time or maybe because of the supply chain and all that stuff during the pandemic has the quality of plastic gone down and that's probably what's all in our bodies and killing us maybe do your own research i don't know what else we got florida dolphin dies of mutated bird flu that is 18 times more resistant to drug treatment all right well we had it go from bird to cow to human and now bird to dolphin let's see what's happening here this is absolutely terrifying the bottlenose dolphin in florida has become one of the latest mammals to die from bird flu according to a new report scientists from the university of florida found this particular bird flu victim after they were notified of a dolphin that appeared to be in distress uh, but a necropsy following its death revealed it contracted a highly deadly strain uh-oh so they were like you know autopsy this thing like ripped it open to find out what its organ said did it choke did it have a disease yeah it was, had a virus the team discovered the virus in the mammal's brain and lungs which had mutated to become 18 times more resistant to current drug treatments look out farmed poultry and wild birds in the u.s have been falling victim to highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses since the end of 2021 but recently has begun spilling over into cows and other mammals Here's a map of the area they're monitoring. We've got Minnesota, Ohio, Kansas, Iowa, New Mexico, Texas. Other mammals to have been found since 2022 outbreak. I mean, they're labeling it. Here we go. We looks like we've got a fox, a lynx perhaps, or a bobcat, a skunk, raccoons. This looks like a coyote. So, uh, yeah, they identified the inflammation in and around its brain and spinal cord. It tested negative for other infections that caused this kind of inflammation. They found bird flu antigen and RNA in its brains and lungs. Specifically, the dolphin was infected with a highly pathogenic avian influenza A, H5N1 virus, of HA clad 2.3.4.4B. I mean, look out. They found some evidence the virus is in the lungs, but most of it was in the brain tissue that covers the brain and spinal cord. So what caused it? What happens when you have brain inflammation? You're going to get all kinds of woozy. It's not exactly common for bird flu to kill seals and sea lions. Uh, it's not considered rare. For cetaceans, the group including dolphins and whales, however, bird flu is rare. All right, people, so watch out, especially if you're down in the uh, tropics swimming with these guys on vacation. Perhaps that's what happened. Maybe a farmer from Idaho or whatever was on vacation down in Cuba, and he went on that little catamaran and hopped in with the dolphin. <coughs> Excuse me there, flipper. And boom, there you have it. Who knows? Shortly before the Florida dolphin died, there had been a bird die-off in the area that experts linked to HPAI. However, genetic testing showed that the flu causing local bird outbreaks did not share the exact genetics with one that killed the dolphin. Genetic testing determined that the virus had not undergone any mutations that would make it more likely to spread to and infect other mammals. They did find, however, that the dolphin's particular H5N1 strain had genetic changes that made it 18 times more resistant to one of the antiviral drugs used to treat bird flu. So alarm, ring the alarm, because the alarmism is real and palpable on that story. Uh, four teenagers, including high school football star age 14 to 16, are killed in a horror crash after cop cruiser used a PIT mover, pit, to stop them speeding at 111 miles per hour. As horrifying photos show their mangled wreckage. Okay, so let's get a quick little glimpse of what they have to say about this. The four teenagers were involved in a police chase. Uh, officers used a maneuver. Basically, you just pull up and you bump them from the side, uh, and it causes the car to uh, lose control. And at those speeds, anything's possible. They were between the ages of 14 and 16 and went to Newberry High School in Bradford County, northeast of Gainesville. Two teens in the car died at the scene. Two others passed away shortly after in the hospital. Uh, one was a sophomore uh, football there's been a GoFundMe set up. Here's an image with his mother, it looks like. Very unfortunate. We do pray for the family members and the souls of these young uh, individuals. There's an image of the wrangled mech literally wrapped around a pole. Um, horrific. So the, it was an SUV, of course, and that's probably why it flipped after the maneuver. Um, Typically, they don't do stuff like this because it is so dangerous and others can be injured and hurt. So it'll be interesting to see why the uh, police decided to go ahead with the pit maneuver. Precision immobilization technique. 
controversial maneuver requires police to hit the back of a moving car and spin it around causing the car to stop while officers surround it. So certainly they would have been trained in this. But let's go ahead and just find out a little bit more about what happened here. Uh, four ski masked teens after stealing a car and getting into a high speed chase with law enforcement who hit the car wrapping it around a pole as we just witnessed. According to the police the car got up to 111 miles per hour. The car was so mangled that it took first responders a whopping 90 minutes to get the teens out. Two teens died at the scene and the other two died in hospital. They were 14 to 16 years old and went to a local high school in Gainesville, Florida. One of the boys' brothers was shot and killed in a separate incident last month. We'll pray for his soul as well. And uh, the teens were driving so fast that police cars couldn't even keep up with them, so they needed a Florida Highway Patrol trooper to take over. Okay, so they passed the buck there. The trooper made intentional contact with the Honda, causing it to decelerate. Honda Patrol said in a statement, the trooper used the break-in speed to perform the pit maneuver on the fleeing Honda to stop the threat. The Honda subsequently rolled over before making contact with the cement pole. Two of the teens uh, had ankle monitors on and three had active warrants. So there's your reason for uh, fleeing right there. The full total story in your news. Sigma Tiger, all up in your grill. Like and subscribe and we'll reveal the man behind the mask. Sigma Tiger. Signing out.